Um, but I do want to get going because um, to be respectful of everyone's time on this panel. And I, I want to start off with saying I'm personally really excited to present these four folks to you all. Um, another upside of hosting this event over Zoom is it can be our first truly national conference. Um, and I'm super excited that we can host a conversation about policy education that spans not only across generations, but across coasts. So um, with that, I'm going to hop right in. Dean Henry Brady is uh, joining us from the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley, and he's also the class of 1941 Monroe Deutsch Professor of Political Science and Public Policy there. Um, Dean Brady received his PhD in Economics and Political Science from MIT in 1980, uh, and he's written extensively on electoral politics and political participation, social welfare policy, political polling, political polarization and trust, and statistical me methodology. Um, and he has worked for the Federal Office of Management and Budget and other organizations in DC. Um, I'd like to introduce our own Dean Ian Solomon as well. Um, trained as a lawyer, he is a devoted student and teacher of both negotiations and conflict resolution. Um, over the course of his career, he's dedicated himself to improving the lives of people across the globe by integrating insights from his experiences in higher education, government, the private sector, and industrial, or excuse me, international organizations. On a personal note, speaking for myself, uh, in this past long, hard year, Dean Solomon, in my opinion, has met these challenges with compassion, resolve, and commitment to students. He clearly takes this community very seriously, as does Jasmine, and I'm sure uh, the Goldman students do as well. So I'm just I'm very thankful that he and Dean Brady um, are lending some of their time to support BPR and the students at Batman and Goldman this afternoon. Um, delighted to have Jigasa Sharma here. Uh, she is a 2021 Masters of Public Policy candidate at the Goldman School. Um, she's also a D-Lab Discovery Graduate Fellow and the co-founder of Technology and Public Policy Club um, at uh, the Goldman School. She holds way more degrees than I ever hoped to try to get um, a Masters in Applied Economics uh, from the National University of Singapore, and she holds a Bachelor's in Economics from the University of Delhi, which she earned um, with honors, and she is an experienced economics and tech policy professional with background working with governments in India, Indonesia, Singapore, and the US. And then a close colleague of mine, Jasmine Rangel, last but not least, is originally from Atlanta, Georgia. She graduated, graduated as a Bonner Scholar from the Berry College in Rome, Georgia in 2017 with a BS in political science. Um, after graduating with that bachelor's uh, degree, Jasmine went on to support civic engagement in institutions of higher education with the National Bonner Foundation in Princeton, New Jersey. This past summer, Jasmine interned with Habitat uh, for Humanity of Greater Charlottesville to mobilize local advocates around the national cost of home campaign, which seeks to make uh, home affordability something possible for all families. Um, while at Batman, ja Batten, Jasmine also serves as the president of the Batten Latinx Network, and she's the co one of the co-founders for the Equity Collaborative. And in just a few short weeks, Jasmine will be channeling her passion to build access to affordable housing for our nation's most underrepresented families as a research specialist with Princeton University's eviction lab. So with that, I'm gonna turn it to Jasmine and then she'll throw it to Jigasa and the floor is yours. Thank you all. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, what an exciting opportunity to get to spend this time with uh, Jigyasa and Dean Brady and Dean Solomon. Um, so I'm really fascinated about this conversation. I think that my own perspectives on leadership have changed throughout my time here at Batten. Um, but I think one of the things that sticks out the most to me recently is um, understanding that leadership is no longer antiquated to the perceptions of who are leaders or what leaders do. In fact, we're seeing now that leadership can be cultivated in various spaces and from various people. Leadership is no longer an exclusive club. Um, it's not so much that everyone can be a leader, it's more so that everyone is a leader. And I think that that's something that Batten is showing us. How can we best showcase our talents? How can we best prepare students and future change makers to best accept their unique attributes and leverage them to make a positive change for our communities. So I'm really excited. Jigyasa, I'd love to hear your own perspective on um, developing the next generation of leaders. Sure, Jasmine. Um, it's an honor to be here, especially as an international student. 
Um, it has been quite a life-changing experience for me to witness everything that has happened in America in the last two years. Um, and I believe that now more than ever, we need leaders who can uh, think creatively, who can instantly zoom in and zoom out uh, about these complex issues, and who not only have the foresight, but also have a very thorough understanding of what mistakes have led to systematic failures um, that we see today. Um, and I'm very honored to be a part of this conversation, especially alongside Dean Brady, who has worked tirelessly throughout his career to nurture and create policy thinkers and leaders at the Golden School. Um, so I think to get us started and you know to do some sort of a level setting for our, for our audience as well, um, I would like to ask both the deans here that how have you seen uh, policy schools as well as students evolve over time and what similarities uh, stick out to you both or or even differences um dean solomon uh, we can just we can start with you first great well thank you jagasta great to to meet you online great to see you jasmine and uh, dean brady great to be with you here um i appreciate this opportunity to to continue to learn from from dean brady who i think has has uh I'm a brand new dean. I'm a baby dean, still figuring my way around. But when I look for, around for, for inspiration and, and deans who speak with real moral courage and really have taken, I think, very strong, powerful, high-risk stands at times for deans speaking about values, I, I look to you and it really has been inspiring for me. And it actually gets to your question, Jagas, I think of perhaps how policy schools might have evolved. Um, I mean, look at this year we've been through. Um, people in the world of policy should not be patting themselves on the back. We've had a very challenging year. We, we witnessed the vulnerability of health institutions, educational institutions, political institutions, right? We have a lot of work to do, right? So hopefully we come out of this with a greater degree of humility, but also commitment and compassion to really solve some of these vulnerabilities we've seen. And if you look just this past year with the, the, the multiple crises that we've dealt with in this country, whether they be around racial justice, um, public health, um, you know, political transitions. Um, I think we in the policy, in the, those of us who are educators in policy making need to say, what are, are we effectively cultivating the leadership we need? Are we cultivating people who are, have the right mix of skepticism and hope with the right mix of kind of critical analytical abilities to tear apart problems and disaggregate them to the small pieces? And yet also, and here's somewhere I think Dean Brady speaks so powerfully, help to create what's the society we want to live in, right? It's not just about doing great analysis, right? We, I'm gonna stipulate that we tr all train our students well for great analysis, but do we actually train people and cultivate people and inspire and empower people who can ask the hard questions about what should an equitable society look like? What, what does a healthcare system that serves all people look like? What does a society that is not crippled by systemic racism look like? And that's where I think we're seeing policy schools speak with a louder, more courageous, more confident voice in that, in that regard. Yeah, thank you. It's wonderful to be here, uh, Dean Solomon. Thank you for inviting me. And Jasmine, it's a, it's a pleasure to meet you. And to Joss, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, you know, it used to be that the notion was that policy schools should be places with neutral competence and that our, our complete contribution was that we provided people with a toolkit to do that neutral, competent kind of evaluation. And I've always worried that that led us down the road of, of maybe enshrining, in fact, only one value, which is Pareto optimality, efficiency uh, and effectiveness. And I don't want to lose that. That's really important. It'd be a shame if we just gave that up. But I think it's increasingly clear that we really have to go beyond that. Uh, we are a policy school in a certain society. And in that society, there are certain values, it seems to me, that are core to, the, to America. And those values include such things um, as uh, equality, uh, democracy, uh, anti-racism. We fought a civil war on the issue. Uh, it should be an easy one to, uh, to adhere to. And unfortunately, it's turned out to be a hard one for our society to, to solve. Uh, we're now in our third period, Reconstruction, then the 60s, the, the 1960s, and now a third period of racial reckoning, and we're still not there. Uh, but I think public policy schools have to speak about these issues. Uh, I think it's really important for us to say there are core values that although they're normative and they're value-laden, they're just so core and fundamental that we have to adhere to them. Now, that doesn't mean we take positions on every policy 
uh, idea that comes along. There may be better or, or worse ways, for example, uh, to uh, improve policing in America. And so while on the one hand, I think we wanna say for sure, policing should be anti-racist uh, in every single way. On the other hand, I'm not sure that we can publicly say, well, we've got exactly the right formula because I'm not sure any of us actually quite know how to do that well right now. But that's where the line is for me. We should be normative, we should be value laden, but we shouldn't necessarily get into all the details of policy in terms of taking public stands. That's not to say that our students and our faculty shouldn't be doing that, and they do. Yes, yeah, so one quick add on to that. Thank you, Dean Brady. Is that you know when the Batten School was being founded 14 years ago in 2007, you know Frank Batten and you know some folks here at the university went looking at other policy schools, and one of the things they saw that troubled them was schools that seemed to tell you all the things you couldn't do and what was wrong with every solution. Right. And I think part of the idea behind Batten and I think behind kind of the creative leadership that Dean Brady has brought is what can we do? How do we actually solve these problems? Not, not what's wrong with every solution, but what's right that we can we, we can put into place. And that sort of bias towards action, bias towards solutions, I think needs to be an important theme going forward. Yep. Yeah, thank you both. Um, Dean Salama, you're kind of hinting on something that I'd love to get your perspective on. Uh, when Jigyasa and I were kind of brainstorming for this session, we talked about how relatively young the Batten School is compared to the Goldman School. Um, and I think that there, there could be some things that you can shed some light on there. How does a relatively school, like new school like Batten, find its place and start to develop its own unique curriculum in amongst the policy landscape. Great, well, you know, as, as you know, Jasmine, this is a new school within a very old school, right? So, so there's certain um, attributes, assets, complexities that come with being at the University of Virginia, being in Charlottesville, Virginia, being two and a half hours from Washington, DC, right? So we are loaded with history, even as a relatively new school. We also were, were, were founded, as I mentioned, by Frank Batten, who wanted us to be a school of leadership and public policy. He wanted to create something different and new and not be just, because you know there are great public policy schools in the world, right? He didn't want to just be another one of them. How does he take his background, which was not public policy, which was basically business leadership, but grounded oftentimes in public service. Um, so we've tried to create a model. A lot of the public policy elements I'll, I'll tell the secret, we often look to Goldman 14 years ago to figure out how do you create a really good policy school? What are some of the, some of the, the, the heroes of Goldman's history about like, you know, the eight steps of policy analysis, borrowing a lot from the Goldman model, but then also wanting to create a, you know, leadership as a core integrated component of both the research and the teaching elements and basing that largely in social psychology um, as a, in finding kind of the foundations of social psychology to kind of develop um, innovative and new curriculums around teaching leadership. So we hope, and it's a work in progress, and, and, and we're always seeking feedback that both taking the best of the schools that do parts really well and then integrating and, and, and innovating around the, the leadership component. Because I think that what the leadership component adds is something that I know I've, you know, we touched on in the, in the first question, which is, you know, it's, it's taking it for us from analysis and the Pareto optimality kind of equation to building institutions, reforming institutions, creating communities that are, are worthy of, of, of our efforts, are worthy of this democracy and its ideals. Um, so, so as a new school, you know, don't be shy about borrowing, copying from those who do it well, and don't be shy or timid about charging ahead and creating new things, taking risks and being different. Uh, Dean Solomon, you said being loaded with history. I, I, that sort of phase took me back to my first day on the campus at Berkeley and visiting the Goldman School. Um, I think there's so much history there in Berkeley and so much history and prestige. And so that brings me to the to the, my question uh, for Dean Brady, is that how does a school that has such uh, an established reputation and has so much history and prestige behind it stay nimble among an ever-changing policy world. Um, and more specifically, if you can talk about how does a policy school decide what to prioritize in their curriculum and values to develop good leaders? Right. Uh, that's a great question. First, let me just say that I think by Batten focusing on leadership, they immediately pose the question is leadership for what? And if leadership is gonna be for Pareto optimality, and efficiency only, 
that seems like a rather weak notion of leadership. Although I do want to mention that my wife once gave me a plaque that said, this marriage is Pareto optimal. <laughs> she heard me say the phrase so much. <laughs> and so that's a joke in our family. Uh, and I, and I, I do have a wonderful marriage. But anyway, uh, I think that it is not always easy, given that you have a history of doing things certain ways. And it certainly means that you have uh, uh, faculty members who have done things in a particular way for a long time, and you want to make them think anew about things. Uh, we've recently had curriculum reform. I had uh, uh, retreat after retreat where I brought up the issues of curriculum reform, and it's been a slow process of getting everybody to agree that that's a good idea. I actually think we've now got real momentum on that, and I'm really pleased with where we're going. And then I, I was just thrilled. I, I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but there's an article in the American Prospect uh, that just came out, which talks about how Berkeley and specifically the Goldman School and the economics department here are changing the way we think about economics by focusing on inequality. And I must say, I'm uh, utterly thrilled because that's been one of the big things uh, in my research. I've written a lot about political inequality and the notion that we finally have sort of gotten there where we're looked upon as a place that actually is focused on trying to understand the inequality and to try to ameliorate it and, and solve the problems it creates it is utterly thrilling. So maybe we have made some progress, although sometimes it seemed very slow. That's really great um, to hear. Uh, maybe I'll come audit a class at the Goldman School. <laughs> um, but Dean Zalman, and this goes for Dean Brady too, um, one thing that I think I always think of is to check my own blind spots or to check any aspects where I'm not performing the best or putting my best foot forward for uh, the kind of leader that I'd like to be. Um, I'd love to hear what sort of things you think, or what sort of blind spots do you think policymakers have today? Either if it's focusing too much on that Pareto efficiency, um, making a data-based approach that may ignore the need for consensus making, uh, what sort of blind spots do you think are existing? And can those be addressed through academia or does that change need to happen in some other professional capacity? Um. Well, let me just take that quickly. I mean, I think one of the biggest things that we have to teach our students is the notion of courage. Um, and, you know, it's really hard to know how to teach that. Um, I sort of often say to them that one thing what policy analysis does give you is that you can uh, analyze an issue, an area, and maybe get some idea of what really better versus worse alternatives are. And that helps at least give me courage often in that I say to myself, okay, I think I can go ahead because although I'm not perfectly sure that this is gonna work or it's the right thing, at least I have some data, some information, some basis for saying it's probably the right thing. And one of the frightening things about being a policymaker is you can do really bad things. Uh, American public policy is littered with examples of people who are ostensibly trying to do good things. I think of public housing, for example, and it just got to be a disaster. Uh, now it's a long, complicated story, and you could argue that some of the people who wanted public housing didn't always want to do, quote, the right thing. But nevertheless, there were enough of them who actually really probably did want to do the right thing, but ended up with this disastrous public housing, these high rise uh, uh, homes, uh, which now are mostly, by the way, gone because they've been dynamited and, and taken down because they were such failures. So it's really scary sometimes because there's a possibility you're going to really make a terrible mistake. But Analysis can help you because you can have hopefully some foresight and some sense that maybe you're not doing exactly the wrong thing. Other thing that's important though that I think we've really become more aware of is let's be inclusive in who we ask about our policies. Let's not just presume that because we've done the analysis and we're so smart that we necessarily know the answer. And in one of the big things I say in all my work on democracy is one of the reasons democracy is I think a great system is it gives voice to people when it's done right voice to people who otherwise wouldn't be heard. And listening to those voices is incredibly important because those voices can sometimes point out to you something that you had just not recognized at all, partly because of your position and your uh, perspectives. Yeah, no, I think that point about uh, who's in the room and who gets a seat at the table and making sure you're hearing other voices is critically important. And 
that's a blind spot, not just for policymakers. I think it's a, it's a blind spot, you know, across leadership generally, or has been, or is at risk of being. And I think what I, you know, the same way you talked Dean Reed about teaching courage, it's teaching an awareness about who's around the table. Are we hearing the voices we need to hear? Are we shutting ourselves up enough to listen to people who might not always often get that seat to speak? And I think one of the blind spots for sure is structural inequity, right? How might the structures, um, I might come through remote, no, no one asked to speak. Okay, so I'm not, you know, except, but why did no one else to speak, ask to speak? Are there structural limitations on people's access to have their voices heard um, in, a, in a functioning democracy. Another blind spot I think is that there are a lot of, and I get this from some of my work in international development of the World Bank, there's some cases where the data is really poor. We don't have good data. And yet we're still quite ready to make big decisions on terrible data. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes you know, think that, well, because we have, or take the surveys, the samples with a Likert, it's very simplified Likert scale, we get some information and then we think we can make very bold conclusions without always doing the hard work of let's go test this out and talk to people. And if the data is not good, let's have more humility about the, the validity of our conclusions and make sure we're testing it with more humanity, more qualitative experiences, more face-to-face, -face, get on the ground, really important. I think we've also seen in the course of this uh, pandemic an overconfidence in our ability to target communications. Right? We think people are actually really going to listen to the details of what we say for Albemarle County versus wherever Danville is in, in Virginia. Right? It's very hard to communicate to people. And then if you want to get precise about you know, mask wearing or washing hands, you know, by the time it gets to people who aren't paying attention, you've already changed, changed the instruction, you're going to have a big mess. Um, and the instructions you may want to give for, for you know, Seattle versus New York versus Virginia or Florida or Texas, it's very different. And I think um, we, we need to have a greater uh, degree of humility about how hard it is to get messages targeted and how hard it is. Because if, if people are not hearing what you're saying, that's your problem as a communicator. Don't blame the listener, blame, bl blame the person trying to communicate. The last thing I'll say is, you know, it gets to the, the early questions about, you know, we think we we think the good life is an equation, and it's more than an equation. Um, so how do we have how do we create the context for conversations about values, and what society we want to achieve together? Um, Dean Solomon, I love that you bring the fact about the blind trust that people nowadays have in data and the over dependency on data. Um, as something that can solve every problem. Um, and that brings me to my next question that I have uh, for Dean Brady. Um, Dean Brady, in one of your essays titled Encountering the Moral Sense uh, in Public Affairs Classroom, you talk about James Wilson and you describe some of the concerns that you have with the modern uh, public policy curriculum. Um, so can you describe what were those concerns that you expressed and can you also talk about what changes would you like to see uh, in the field? Yeah, my, my biggest thing is uh, in that paper is that uh, I've been concerned for many, many years, as I think I said earlier, that the, we would be schools of market failure and that we would just look at situations where there are externalities or needs for public goods and so forth and focus entirely on that. And we would never ask the question of what kind of society do we want to create? And I want to create, and I think most people want to create, uh, a society in which justice and fairness reign supreme, where people have a sense of duty and responsibility uh, towards one another and empathy. Uh, that's the society I want. Um, I'm not only sure that, uh, and I, I'm, I've got a PhD in economics, so I, I'm, I'm certainly a believer that economic analysis can be worthwhile, but sometimes the model of people in economics as utility maximizers with freedom of choice and that freedom to choose within the budget constraint is really sort of the maximum value uh, strikes me as a very limited model. You know, people actually do have other characteristics. And one of the interesting things about James Q. Wilson is towards the end of his life, he wrote a book called The Moral Sense in which he tried to explore the kinds of issues that actually Adam Smith explored, not in The Wealth of Nations, uh, but in another book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments in which he has a much more sophisticated notion of what human beings are about than what you find in the wealth of nations and in uh, most economic modeling. And I think we need to teach people more about what human beings are really about and what human beings really want. And then I went on to talk in that essay too about how 
we don't teach a lot about stratification systems. Uh, it's always worried me that economics is sort of almost an afterthought says, oh, and of course there's the question of the initial distribution uh, or the final outcomes, uh, but uh, we're not gonna really talk a lot about that. Now, that's why I'm so happy to see that the Goldman School was just lauded for focusing on inequality because that is about distributions um, and it is about stratification systems like who has power, who has status, who has wealth and income. And we need to teach our students uh, more, I think, about those systems, which means that uh, we probably need more sociologists uh, and people who study those systems. And the truth is most public policy schools are mostly political scientists, uh, economists, and maybe a smattering of psychologists, but we haven't had a lot of sociologists. And I would think that, may, and I don't have a degree in sociology, I have a degree in political science and a degree in economics. So me saying this means that I think there's limits to what I know. Uh, and I think policy schools would do better if we talked more about the nature of power and privilege uh, and how that's replicated from generation to generation uh, often in ways that's completely unfair. Dean, thanks for that answer, uh, Dean Brady. Dean Solomon, would you would you like to add something to that? Um, any concerns that you see in the current public policy curriculum? Yeah, it's hard to add much to that. I, I, I actually think that Dean Brady's um, essay and analysis of James Q. Wilson and the moral sense is, is really very powerful and important for all of us in, in the public policy education to be thinking about. Um, and certainly, you know, the way, you know, he presented kind of, you know, none of us are going to know everything, right? No field is going to have a monopoly on knowledge or truth or solving problems. So how are we improving our capacity to work interdisciplinarily um, and getting insights from sociology, from history, perhaps from religious studies, you know? Um, you know, I think we, 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 we tend to be heavier in, in very valuable insights from economics. And we have thus very heavy insights from political science and social psychology, but there are many other fields that can contribute a lot. Um, and there will be fields 10, 15 years from now that we don't even have in the, in the academy right now as we continue to evolve. And you know, that's the risk of these institutions that I think COVID is helping to disrupt a little bit, that are we being responsive to what's actually happening in the world? You know, I think we'll see more, you probably are starting to see some departments now focus on inequality itself as a discipline, understanding kind of the relationship between people, and, you know, inequality. And that will, that will borrow, that will itself be an interdisciplinary, I think, field of study. Um, so to me, the, the, the quality of our public policy going forward will be to continue to draw more from multiple disciplines, to look outside the academy. I think you're seeing, you know, the, the role of government and the private sector and then other sectors of influence on people's lives and their well-being is growing. Um, so how are we thinking about the integration between business and policy, right? Because the policies of Facebook might have a bigger impact on your life than the policies of, you know, the communications regulatory bodies, right? So, so, so how are we thinking about, about the, you know, how are, we, how are we getting more people to the table, asking more questions, making sure that we are constantly evolving our definition of Again, not what is public policy, but what is the quality of your life and are we improving it? What are the risks you face and are we mitigating them? Right? What are your opportunities and are we helping them to grow and expand? Yeah, let me just say that a gender studies would be an example of something that's really completely changed our view of the world. When I entered political science, people studied war and never talked about what happened to women in wars. And it turns out horrific things happen to women in wars. And gender studies has really brought that to the forefront. And we now have a lot more research on what happens in terms of all the awful things that happen during wartime to women. And uh, gosh knows, there's probably other things we have not uncovered yet that we should be more aware of. Uh, and so you're absolutely right, I think, Dean Solomon, that we, we've got to make sure that we're aware of what's happening in other disciplines. Yeah, I'm, I'm also trying to keep my eye on the time uh, because we want to give some time for our audience as well. But this was a super engaging uh, discussion. Uh, but before we open it to q and I have a very special question for you, Dean Brady. And, um, you know, the Goldman School recently announced Dr. David Wilson of the University of Delaware as the new Dean of GSPB. And you are definitely leaving behind some very big shoes to fill. So I would love to hear from you. What would be your advice to the incoming Dean of, of the Goldman School? 
you know, I'm not sure he needs my advice. He's an incredibly talented uh, uh, guy. Uh, and uh, he's just really amazing. Uh, he does work on racial resentment. Uh, and I think he's actually helped political scientists have a much better and deeper understanding of what's going on with racism uh, and, and his wonderful work. He has also done work on voter ID laws and things like that. He's been a very talented administrator at the University of Delaware. Uh, he was in the military. Uh, he's just got an extraordinary background and uh, I'm, I'm incredibly happy to be able to turn over the school to a person as accomplished as he is. And I think he's gonna lead us into just even better places. So um, advice, uh, well, I, you know, the Berkeley bureaucracy, uh, <laughs> that I can help him with a little bit and try to explain to him how public universities like Berkeley operate and all the complexities of it. Um, but in general, he doesn't really need my advice. And I'll just say, you know, um, I'm looking forward to working with him and I think there are opportunities for us to collaborate coast to coast, whether it's student programs, whether it's joint research projects, whether it's tackling some of these hard issues, because you know, no, no school is going to do it by itself. Um, we really can benefit um, from engaging each other. And that's not something I think historically we've done enough of. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jasmine, is there any last questions that you have before we toss it out for Q&A? Yes, I definitely do. And this is also a much more personal one for Dean Solomon. Uh, so Dean, I started my MPP career when you were starting your uh, adventure as the Dean of the Batten School. And so I'm in the spirit of transition, similar to Dean Brady, you're staying, but I'm transitioning out of the school. Uh, what gives you hope as you see our class, both the BA program and the MPP program? Um, what hope do you have as we near graduation? What do you think we have yet to learn or should be keeping our eye out for learning out in the world? It's a lot more to learn. You shouldn't leave yet, Jess, but stick around for a while. Um, but I mean that, you know, I'll come back to that point uh, somewhat seriously. Um, a lot of things give me hope. I mean, you've, we've been through a rough time together, right? Not every generation can say they kind of, you know, went through it, survived a pandemic so far. We've survived this pandemic. Um, you know, but that will give the graduates now, the people in school now, a, set of, a, a sense of resourcefulness and resilience that many other generations have not had, right? You've had a chance to be observers or witnesses to a range of public policy failures and successes, right? And if, if you can step out of the crisis enough to actually reflect on, you know, the earliest conversation we had a year ago when I was apologizing for having to send people home and saying, we'll be back in the fall, don't worry. Um, Right, you know, our own humility, but how we how we appreciate data, how we all develop just enough expertise to be dangerous about epidemiology, and how we learn. Okay, let's actually trust the experts, and how we you know watch our our, our systems play out, and and why we have the CDC, and why we have a World Health Organization. So, so you know, I think we, in the failure, we actually hopefully you know your 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 classmates and you and others around the country have a sense of both responsibility about making sure our institutions are working, are serving them well, making sure we are repairing the evident fragility in our political structures, right? So, so, so you know, um, someone once said recently that, uh, you know, what Trump did for Biden was he gave him rel relevance, right? This period has given public policymakers now and policies tremendous relevance, right? The, the burden of figuring out a post-COVID economy, society, healthcare system, employment system falls heavily on your shoulders. So that's a burden, but it's also an amazing opportunity to try to, to get to Dean Brady to create the society we want to have, right? What, what should a post-COVID America and not just America, right? You know, Giyasi, you're from overseas. What is our relationship and our responsibility to other countries now that can't even access the vaccines because of deals we struck here, right? So, so, so that, it gives me a sense of hope, burden, and responsibility all at the same time. In terms of what you need to keep learning, I there's so many things, but that's the key point, to keep learning, to recognize that you're, you're two years here, hopefully you've started to develop some habits of mind that will serve you well, some habits of an analytically, of skepticism, of curiosity, of working with others. But this is, this, you know, we need to keep learning. Right, you know, policy making is an is an evolving field. 
the solutions that you will try to tap and structure will continue to evolve. Um, the nation state as a structure will evolve. You know, the things we've taken for granted about which is the reserve currency in the world may continue to evolve, right? So the adaptability, the flexibility you've taken now, um, that's what I hope you will continue to realize that keep learning, never stop learning, be a student of life. Um, thanks for that, Dean um, Solomon. And I, I I can relate to it because this is going to be my second master's degree. And after every degree, I feel my journey is just becoming steeper and steeper. So, so you know, Dean Brady, uh, you have something to say, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that one of the exciting things about the current moment is to see students and the world concerned about racial justice. Um, yeah. It is both a sadness to me uh, that it's been uh, so many years since the 1960s, which was the last period in America where we were really focused on those issues. I think it, uh, in the 19, late 1960s, I worked with a, a guy named John Payton, who went on to be head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund at the uh, Claremont Colleges to try to create a Black Studies Center. Uh, and, and we had some success, but that, then nothing really seemed to happen. I mean, we have gotten better in race relations. I do believe there's been progress. But to think that we are where we are today with still all the problems um, mm -hmm. is really mortifying and awful. And frankly, a knock on our generation, my generation, I'm the baby boomer, boomer generation. I wish we had done better. We did not do as well as we should have. And I'm really hoping that young people now will um, do better than we did. So sorry to... Uh, hand that problem off, but uh, uh, we, we must, we just must do better. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, on doing better, involving everyone in the conversation, I think it's time we open the floor for Q&A. Um, and we have um, some really interesting questions lined up. So the first one that I see here is uh, for, the, for both deans, um, but also for the students, uh, if you could wave a magic wand and make pattern or Goldman perfect, what would it look like? What would be different or the same? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that, um, or at least one element, and I'm sure Dean Brady can add on um, additional ones. How do I make us more accessible, more affordable? Um, I want us, you know, and that will also enable us to be more diverse, more inclusive, and it'll enable people to come benefit from what we teach and then take it back to communities that they may that they may not go back to now. Um, so, so yeah, I think you know, that would be a lever that would actually improve the quality of our education and our impact in many different dimensions. So, so, so that, that's, you know, my magic wand would be, okay, students, we've now created a liberating degree for you. You leave it debt free, you can come from anywhere, come here. And when you go out, you choose where in the world you wanna have your impact without worrying about how you're gonna pay for your degree. Boy, I, I would second that, I mean, I, I'm a little worried about the fact that some schools like NYU got $25 million recently and then McCourt just got another $100 million. And in both cases, the argument is they're gonna use it for student aid. And I think that's great and that will solve their problems. But I, I really wish that we could have a mechanism whereby we would use some of those funds to do the following as well, which we're trying to do at Goldman. We're trying to meet with as many California State University colleges as we can. And for those who don't know the, the California system, the, the Cal State colleges uh, do an incredible job of educating a lot of the uh, low income and marginalized populations in California. The University of California is the elite system and we do okay, but we don't do as well as we should by any means. And so I'm convinced that at those colleges, there are lots of people uh, well, my twin brother, my twin brother, I got to go to a private college because I was the better student than my twin brother. My family didn't have enough money. He went to Cal State University. Uh, he played basketball there too. So that was a happy thing for him. But the point is, is that not every family can afford to send their kids to even places like Berkeley, which are relatively affordable compared to a lot of private institutions. Uh, and so I really wanna make sure that we go out and work hard to get the word out to people at historically black universities, to Latinx universities, to places like the Cal State universities, that public policy is here, that we really want you to be at Berkeley, and we really believe that you can be at Berkeley and succeed. And I think by doing that, we'll do more than just essentially throw money at the problem. We'll actually create 
a larger pipeline of people and then hopefully also diversify our, our student body. Uh, California is 40% Latinx right now. We're nowhere near 40% in the students we admit. Uh, we're getting better year by year, but we're not where we should be. And it's really important that we get there because diversity in the public service is one way we can ensure more equity in the way government programs are administered and provided. Amazing, thank you both. Uh, our next question almost gets into what I would respond to uh, that former question that, that Jigyasa said. I love um, learning from community members here in Charlottesville on how I can better become a policymaker or change maker in my own community. Uh, so to the both of you, what are some creative ways beyond conventional wisdom um, that are both actively engaging, investing, and in incre increasing room at the table for those who might not otherwise be welcomed at such tables to educate our students. Um, yeah. Well, we, we are lucky uh, to be in Berkeley and with Oakland nearby and Richmond nearby and communities that uh, have uh, large populations, communities of color, and also that are low income areas. And uh, you know that allows us to have all sorts of interactions with nonprofits that are trying to do good things in those communities. And therefore we have our uh, advanced policy analysis, our master's project essentially, uh, where people go out and work with those uh, organizations. They do their internships with those organizations and they do the introductory policy analysis work with them. And they also just during the year often get involved with those organizations through our student clubs and other mechanisms. The students do a wonderful job of linking up with a lot of those organizations. Uh, so all of that, I think, has been really, really important for us. Yeah, I'll just say, and this is, you know, I think this is a great question. I think we all should be thinking about creative ways to reach more people, to be of value, to be a better service to more people out there. I mean, it's a fairly small segment of the world that can afford to spend two years full-time paying tuition, not earning an income, living in Charlottesville. For example, I'm sure the same is true in Berkeley, right? Right. So, so what are the populations that have to hold down a full-time job and yet still want to pick up these skills that are caring for parents or doing other things? So how do we think very much out of the box, whether it's weekend programs, evening programs, Berkeley may be further along than we are here at Batten on this, but we are still fairly traditional in what types of classes for what types of students at what types of times during the day and the weekend, what types of buildings, et cetera. I think this past year is kind of forcing us to think, are there more options using digital technologies, using different times, thinking more broadly, perhaps collaborating and doing joint courses between Berkeley and Baton at the same time for new populations. So, so you know, I think, you know, I agree with the Dean Brady's answer, but how do we take our kind of our current students and engage them more in the community? That's a, that's a big opportunity for us. Um, but then how do we even just think about turning it on its head and think about how are we serving those people in the communities with our educational opportunities that we have. And again, there are financial model challenges, there's regulatory approvals. So I'm not saying this is easy, but that's the orientation we, I think we need to increasingly have. Well, um, I guess today's problem, nothing is easy. And, uh, and therefore the next question that we have is also not an easy one, but rather very interesting in a way a tricky one to answer. Um, so the question we have is, why do you think um, so many public policymakers think of themselves as public servants, and yet so many people feel um, severely underserved by policymakers at the state and federal levels? Yeah, well, we have a faculty member, uh, Amy Lerman, who's written a book called Good Enough for Government Work. And uh, it's a wonderful book. And, and the title actually almost tells the entire story. It used to be, believe it or not, that good enough for government work was a positive statement about how if you did work that was really good, wow, that's good enough for government work. Hmm. That was in the 40s and 50s. Today, the phrase is used as in derisive manner. Oh, good enough for government work, not really very good. We've really had a situation where people have lost trust in government. And a lot of what Amy shows in this book is that uh, this is ideologically driven, uh, that especially uh, as among Republicans, for example, that they simply just don't believe the government can do anything for them. But it's also true among low-income populations. Uh, and I think that's partly because of history of marginalization, not being listened to, not being uh, involved. And so one of the big things we have to do, I mean, my research has all been on political participation. 
And I've constantly tried to argue for ways to involve more people in more ways in politics uh, and how important that is. That's why it's heartbreaking to see the kind of legislation we've seen in Georgia in the last few days uh, being passed. Uh, it's just unbelievable, some of it. And because some of it is so obviously the wrong way to go. Uh, and so all that's going to do, I think, is increase distrust in government and make it even harder to get those communities mobilized. And the truth is, because they're not mobilized, that's one of the reasons that decision makers don't take them seriously. I remember the famous uh, uh, Western New York State uh, member of Congress who at one point said, um, and when he was talking about the tax cut that Trump proposed, that he talked to his contributors and they all told him that he better vote for that tax cut, which would benefit them enormously, uh, or he just shouldn't come and talk to them anymore. And all I could think of is he talked to his contributors, but he didn't talk to his constituents. I'm not sure his constituents would have said, gee, hurrah, you're voting for this tax cut that's going to give the rich lots more money, but not really help me very much. But that's the problem. The contributors are involved and the folks who are uh, lower income are not involved. Yeah, no, I, we've all heard the, the, the joke. I'm here from the government, I'm here to help. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and how do we restore that notion that the government is actually an institution that we own, that we create, that we build, that we support, that we need to hold accountable to be helpful to us. Um, and I think the ideological issue that, 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 that uh, Dean Brady talked about, I think there have been many governments, or many administrations, political administrations at both federal and state and local level that want to starve the institutions to the point where they are so ineffective that it proves the point that government is ineffective. Where, and, and a lot of the ref, so-called reforms we have seen have not been about improving the quality and efficiency and equity and helpfulness of government services, but rather ideologically to starve them and make them, to make, to help people lose faith in government, right? And so there's been a very cynical, I would think, anti-government crusade that's been quite dominant in American politics for a while. I'm hopeful and I'm actually detecting a sense that some of that cynicism might be at a transition point now. I think this is President Biden's greatest task. If he can show that government can help solve the COVID crisis, can reboot the economy, I think there'll be a lot more faith and trust in government, uh, at least among some quarters. And so that, that's my great hope. So along those lines on things that possibly kind of aid and fuel these anti-government sentiments, I think that there's no short of phrases that we hear nowadays that our communities are extremely polarized and that we're a really polarized society and global system. Um, with so little agreement on facts and norms, how should policymakers practice their profession to serve communities that are polarized as ever? Yeah, let me just take a, I've been doing research in this area. This is what some people call an epistemic crisis. Epistemology, of course, has to do with the study of how we know what we know. And the truth is now increasingly we have groups in society which know completely different things. And it can't be true that X and not X are both true. That's a basic tenet of logic. Um, although maybe even that's up for grabs these days. Uh, so the problem is, is that we increasingly have situations where people are distrustful of science, higher education, the press, and it turns out that's mostly people who are conservatives. Uh, there's tremendous polarization and levels of trust in these institutions with Democrats trusting the press, higher education, and science, and Republicans trusting the military, police, and religious institutions. Uh, and on both sides, that's just really a shame because both, all those institutions have something to, to contribute to society. Uh, and the notion that we have these partisan divides over whether or not these institutions are really believable and trustworthy is really frightening. And I must admit, I'm not completely sure how you overcome those divides, except perhaps, again, through the performance of some of these institutions showing that they can, in fact, solve problems. And that's at least the best I can do as a public policy dean and say, that's our challenge. Let's show that government can perform. Yeah, I, I, 
I share the the uh, the hope, but a little bit of the pessimism. I, I think it, this is a real challenge for us. This this epistemic crisis that we face. I do think that we can chip away at it, though. Um, and and as uh, Wyatt Andrews said before, you know, train the algorithm so that we at least in our own work are trying to be fact based, trying to be evidence based, trying to make sure that we are not perpetuating this distrust of information institution, that we are trying to design our institutions to be transparent and accountable, right? Because yes, there will always be fake news, there always have been snake oil salesmen, etc. But can we build and strengthen those institutions that are actually, you know, making decisions based on facts and evidence and being careful? You know, can we invest in, in good journalism, right? So that, so that we, you know, we don't lose <laughs> good news in the world, right? It's, it's been a struggle. I guess Trump was in some ways good for the industry, but actually it was quite also good for uh, the opponents of the industry. So how do, how do we make sure we, we are, we are as educators, as consumers of information, really you know, building the antidotes to this epistemic crisis as best we can? It's not going to be easy. Um, and you know we see the power of conspiracy theories to take hold in such a way that how we will unwind them remains a mystery to me. But th but that is, you know, I sometimes wonder. I want us to do more bat than we do now, and I know Wyatt Andrews does this within UVA on media literacy. But I sometimes wonder if I need to hire my teenage son to teach it for us, because I think there's a way that even how I even think about media literacy may be already outdated. And are there ways that we will be have new technologies and new creative minds of the next generation thinking about how to actually improve our ability to verify assertions um, and, to, and to fact check instantaneously a, a, a new way? Because we're going to need to with, with deep fakes and other things. We're going to need verification models. And I think uh, you know there's enough smart minds thinking there. I, I think we can. I hope we can stay one step ahead of the curve. Amazing. Well, we are almost to time, but we have one more question that we'd love to ask you both um, before we kind of depart. Uh, so for both Dean Brady and Dean Solomon, if you went 10 to 15 years back in time and you told your past self about the present moment, what would surprise you? Well, obviously the pandemic is a surprise because I think very few of us really understood I'm sure epidemiologists did, and what's interesting is that they immediately got on the case and were saying, look, be careful here. This looks like it's just a little outbreak, but it's going to blossom, balloon, explode, which is what it did. And so that's one thing that's a surprise. But the other thing is, is that, in fact, uh, we've had a racial reckoning that we're really confronting, again, the issues of race. It's now even more than that. It's uh, violence against Asians and, and other groups. Uh, and I think, I'm not sure I'd be totally surprised. I know the history of America and I know how these things have happened, but I'm sort of surprised at the virulence of it and what Donald Trump was able to mine in his approach to governing and what he's created. And I guess I was naive and didn't realize how powerful and strong some of those undercurrents were. And it's tragic to me that they are so strong in America and it makes me cry for America. So 15 years ago, the iPhone had not yet been introduced, right? So to think about how fast things change, and I often tell students, you know, change is the essence of life. So while I agree and, and, cr and cry alongside um, Dean Brady on our failure to make progress or failure even to acknowledge failure, um, on, on fundamental issues of, of equity and racial justice in this country. All right, I also, if we take a longer view, you can see enormous progress that we have made because of science, because of technology, because of advancements in, in, in inclusion of people, right? In 2006, we weren't talking about marriage equality in a meaningful way. Some people were, they were being laughed at and ignored, right? We weren't talking about trans rights in any meaningful way. Right, so, so at the same time that there's a lot to, 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 to cry about and, and failure to move forward, we, we now take for granted things that we never we would have imagined possible. Like the possibilities, if we channel it right, for telehealth to transform access to healthcare across the world to communities that never could have it before. 
to, to enable you know, new payment systems, to deliver remittances more cheaply. So enormous progress. So I'm, I'm both surprised by, I think, the, the, the depth and the pain of um, how little it seems we've progressed and then overwhelmed by how fast we've moved forward. Yes, it's well to remember that there has been progress in some arenas and it, that's good and, and we should celebrate that because otherwise we're going to get really depressed. Well, well thank you both so much. Oh, yes. Here I'm you go. so sorry to cut you off, Jasmine, but I don't know if the attendees can see the entire question, but the end of it asks Jasmine and Jigasa what has surprised them about their time at Batten Goldman. I, I don't know if you can fit it into 30 seconds, but I'd, I'd love to hear the answer to that too. Jigasa, do you want to go first? Yeah, I was like, why did she not read the second part of it? So yeah, I, I think uh, there have been lots of surprises because of the pandemic. But for me, coming from Asia to here, um, I like I already said it was life changing. But one word that I always use for my experience at Berkeley, and that has been liberating. Um, it has, I have felt like, like I've like my mind has just opened up. Um, and I think for that, I'm very grateful. And that was surprising also because I did not know so many things about this world, about myself. And I, in many ways, I feel I've like, I'm discovering myself again, like over and over again. So I think that has been the most um, surprising and yet the most beautiful uh, part of, uh, of my journey at Goldman. So I'm very thankful for that. And like I said, very honored to be a part of this panel with Dean Solomon, Jasmine, and Dean Brady. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks, Jigyasa. And the only thing that I would add uh, that would surprise me about my time at Batten is how deep and meaningful of a community I've been able to make. Um, I think it's, it, it's not one that I take lightly and it's something that's uh, definitely helped me get through the ups and downs of a master's degree as a first generation student. So thank you all so much for your time and for your wisdom that you've offered us today. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Great to be with you, Dean Brady. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to be here.